Welcome to the first part of the slideshow on ecosystems. If you remember during the population ecology portion last week, you looked at the different components that make up an ecosystem, starting from the smallest unit, which was the organism or an individual. The individuals will form a group within their own species in the particular region where they're living called a population. Populations of other living organisms within that same envir environment will then form a community. And then communities, which are all of the living organisms plus the non-living components in the specific area where these all interact, are then called an ecosystem. Then ecosystems will build to a larger area called a biome and all of the biomes within the planet are considered a part of the biosphere, which is all living organisms on the earth. So as you look at, <clears throat> excuse me, the image below, which is of a decaying tree stump, you can see that this is actually a thriving microenvironment all on its own. There's lichen that you can see is the sort of purplish gray stuff towards the bottom right of the tree. There's moss and you can see the little spore sacs, the sporangia up on the top there. Um, you can infer that there are probably insects living in there and there might even be some vertebrate animals living down farther in that tree stump. So this is in and of itself a thriving environment for an ecosystem. Ecosystems are all going to share two components. They're all going to have the biotic environment, and that is all of the living organisms. That is, whether they're plants, fungi, bacteria, animals, doesn't matter. If they're living, they're a part of the biotic environment. It will also include the abiotic environment or the physical components. These are the things that constitute the habitat. These are the rocks. This is the water. This is the circulation of air, aspects of climate, so the temperature and precipitation would also be abiotic factors within the ecosystem. So look at the scenario below, pause the video, and when you've come up with an answer, play the video again. So hopefully you realized that for an ecosystem, you're going to have to have different species interacting at the same time within a specific place and that's going to define a desert. So there are a variety of biomes. These are larger areas that all share a similar type of feature and these are going to be determined largely by temperature and rainfall. So what is the average temperature within the the entire region of a biome, it should be fairly similar. And if it changes too much, then you've probably left one biome and gone to another. What's the average rainfall, the amount of precipitation? <clears throat> Do you get seasons or is there really a lack of seasonality? So in Louisiana, for instance, you kind of only get two seasons, where if you're living here in Virginia, then you'll get discreetly four seasons. Is the rainfall constant or does it vary seasonally? So in many areas in the southwest you get extended periods of dry with really only one rainy season, a monsoon season, and that typifies that portion of the biome. So again biomes are temperature and precipitation determined. The Primary productivity levels are going to depend on how much organic matter there is. And what this really is going to come down to is what and how many primary producers are there. Primary producers are always a plant substance of some variety, something that can, or perhaps a protist, something that can perform photosynthesis. And it's going to determine the presence of primary producers what type of organism is there performing photosynthesis, how abundant and diverse they are, is going to determine everything else about that region or that biome. A lush, thriving primary producer population 
is going to lead to a thriving biome. And if it's very restricted, then you're going to have a much less habitated, inhabited biome. So as we look here, there are nine primary terrestrial biomes. So these are all biomes of the land. And you can see, if you look at the map in the top right, that each one is particular to a one, in general, one or two different latitudes. So if you notice, polar ice is exclusively, well, at the poles, and that makes a lot of sense. Tundra, you don't get much tundra in the southern hemisphere, but in the northern hemisphere, it's only at a very low latitude, latitudes near but just below the pole where you get them. Then as you go more equatorially or down into the higher latitudes, then you get into the coniferous forests. As it gets even warmer, you get into the, well, a range of the chaparral, the temperate deciduous forests, the temperature, temperate grasslands. As you get more equatorial, you get the savannas and finally the tropical forests. And dick, uh, deserts are going to be dictated by two primary regions. They're going to be determined by latitudes, and we're going to look at that in a few slides. And they're also going to be dictated by topography, and we'll look at that in a few minutes. And if we look at the aquatic or the water biomes, we see that there are five. <coughs> Within them, the open oceans, estuaries, wetlands, and coral reefs are going to be brackish to marine or saltwater, whereas the lakes, ponds, and the rivers and streams are freshwater. And in each one of these biomes, you're going to have a different suite of plant life and different animal life that occupies them. So again, pause the video until you have the answer and then replay it to advance. And if you had, oops, I didn't highlight it there, I apologize. The part of the world where you would expect to see deserts, if you follow with the map here, if we look at the northern half of South America, not so much, but the northern half of Africa, yes indeed, here we get a tremendous amount of desert, and so number two would be the best answer. If you continue on, the east coast of North America has no desert, and India subcontinent has a small amount of desert, but certainly not all of India. And I mentioned before that deserts are going to in part be dictated by the topography, and this is one of the primary examples that we look at on how topography can dictate weather completely. So what we're going, you're going to notice is that on the windward side, on the side of the mountain from which the wind is coming, you're going to have generally warm, moist air because this is going to be coming off of a body of water, say an ocean. As this warm water is blown towards the mountain, again on the windward side, it's going to be forced upwards. As it's forced upwards, it gets into higher altitudes, and at these altitudes, it's colder. That's going to force the moisture in the atmosphere to begin to condense, and you're going to get rain cloud formation, and eventually you're going to get precipitation. With tall peaks, like you get in the Rockies or the Alps or the Andes, what's going to happen is essentially it snows out. It precipitates all of the moisture from the combination of the windward side and the peaks of the mountains, which leads to dry air passing over the mountains and you get a rain shadow. And that's where we get deserts. That's where we have the Sonora Desert in the southwest of the United States. That's where we get the Atacama Desert on the eastward side of the Andes and so on. And we can notice another interaction like this. This is a photograph taken in uh, Wyoming and you can see all along the mountains in the background at the peak of those snow-capped mountains, you have a range of clouds. All of the moisture from west of the Rockies there is raising up, forming clouds, and precipitating, providing that snow on the snow-capped mountains. And then you largely have very desert conditions or near-desert conditions in the better part of Wyoming. And 
in a similar way, global air patterns are going to circulate, creating certain latitudes that are going to be far more likely to experience deserts, and they're also going to be the primary recipients of rainforests. So as we look, why should this happen? And it makes a lot of sense if you look at the physics of it, those sun rays coming, well, from the sun, when they reach polar regions, because of the curvature of the Earth, you have the same amount of sunlight, but it is spread over a longer distance or a larger area, and so you don't get as much direct sunlight because of this distribution. Whereas near the equator, you have more direct access, and the sunlight is hitting a smaller area, so it can be more forceful. This is why at the equators, where it's going to tend to be warmer, we're going to have warm air coming up. And in colder regions, we're going to have uh, low pressure areas, and we're going to tend to have rainfall coming down. So as we look at this, water, when it's warmed, is going to be heated and evaporate. This is going to cause it to go upwards. Once it gets to high altitude, it's going to form clouds. Those clouds will eventually condense to the extent that they can no longer hold any water, and you're going to get precipitation. This is going to <clears throat> lead to high rain volume areas that are going to lead to the rainforests, and it's going to lead to the same uh, mountain effect where you're going to have the dry desert region to the leeward side, the non-windward side of the mountains. And so as we look at how this is going to establish itself on the planet, what we get is this low pressure where the air, warm air is rising at the equator, but at approximately 30 degrees north as well as 30 degrees south latitude, these pools of air are going to descend, they're going to come back down to the earth, and we're going to get dry air there. And again, towards the pole, we're going to have cold, dry air falling, and at approximately 60 degrees north and 60 degrees south latitude, we're going to have warm, moist air rising, and so these are going to tend to be your uh, wetter areas, and at 30 degrees north and south latitude, as well as towards the poles, we're going to tend to have our cooler, drier areas, and this is where you'll get deserts. And while we don't tend to think of Antarctica or the Arctic as being dry because they're cold, they're simply a cold desert rather than a hot desert. And so this takes us to the end of the first portion. When you're ready, you can advance to the second set of, to the second video and advance the slides farther.